so uh, now let's talk about the facial nerve in the medial wall of middle ear cavity so the nerve enters the internal acoustic meatus after coming out of inner ear in the inner ear it takes the first turn called external genu and you have a ganglion over there called geniculate ganglion now the nerve enters the medial wall of middle ear cavity you are seeing the medial wall from laterally that means your tympanic membrane has been removed what you are seeing here is your medial wall what is that bulge present in the medial wall of middle ear cavity that is your promontory you have tympanic plexus of nerves over the promontory what is promontory the first basal turn of cochlea forms a bulge on the medial wall above and behind the promontory you have oval window below and behind the promontory you have round window and that is your impression for lateral semicircular canal so the nerve runs between the lateral semicircular canal impression and oval window next the nerve turns to the posterior wall of middle ear cavity to emerge out of the stylomastoid foramen and here you can see the nerve runs vertically downwards in the posterior wall out of stylomastoid foramen now what is attached to the oval window yes that is foot plate of stapes now you can see a muscle which is attached to neck of the stapes what is that muscle called as stapedius facial nerve supplies muscles of second branchial arch stapedius develops from the second branchial arch okay now stapedius is attached to the pyramid which is present in the posterior wall of middle ear cavity inferiorly you can see in the jugular fossa internal jugular vein and carotid canal internal carotid artery plexus around the internal carotid artery forms a nerve called deep petrosal nerve which joins your greater petrosal nerve to form median nerve okay you can see greater petrosal nerve is given at the level of geniculate ganglion and to the stapedius muscle nerve to stapedius 6 mm above the stylomastoid foramen you have coda tympani nerve let us see in detail about all the branches of facial nerve once it comes out it is called extracranial course which passes into the parotid gland divides into five branches to supply the muscles of face okay now let's talk about median nerve so the nerve of pterygoid canal or median nerve enters the pterygoid canal to reach the pterygopalatine fossa which is deep to the pterygomaxillary fissure there is a ganglion called pterygopalatine ganglia present in the fossa now the post ganglionic fibers you can see the canal and which reaches your pterygopalatine fossa okay these fibers supplies your lacrimal gland glands of palate and nose so in case of allergic rhinitis this ganglion is getting stimulated which causes secretion in all these glands so running eyes and running nose occurs when the pterygopalatine ganglion is stimulated hence this ganglion is otherwise called ganglion of hay fever let's move on to coda tympani now so before the nerve coming out of stylomastoid foramen coda tympani nerve is given 
just 6 mm above the level of exit. To know the cause of coda tympani, let's consider the lateral wall of middle ear cavity. We have tympanic membrane with ear ossicles, malleus and incus. This coda tympani nerve runs above the tympanic membrane between pars flaccida and pars tensa. It enters through posterior tympanic canaliculus, emerges out through anterior tympanic canaliculus. Medial end of the anterior tympanic canaliculus is called petrotympanic fissure. Just remember, along with your coda tympani nerve, anterior ligament of malleus and anterior tympanic branch of maxillary artery also emerges out of your petrotympanic fissure. Now, this coda tympani nerve, it moves forward medial to the spine of spinoid bone. In front of the spine of spinoid, we have a foramen called foramen ovale. Mandibular nerve comes out of this foramen divides into anterior and posterior branch. One of the branches from the posterior division is lingual nerve which joins with the coda tympani and this relays in the submandibular ganglion. The postganglionic fiber supplies the submandibular and sublingual salivary glands. extracranial cause of facial nerve. After the nerve exits from the skull, before turning forwards, it supplies three muscle, posterior belly of digastric, posterior auricular muscle and stylohyoid. It enters posterior medial surface of parotid to divide into cervicofacial and temporofacial branches. Temporofacial gives temporal branch, zygomatic branch. Cervicofacial gives buccal, marginal mandibular and cervical branches. Now let's move on to the lesion of facial nerve. So these are the motor nucleus of facial nerve. And this is the cerebral cortex on right and left side. part of nucleus which supplies the upper part of the face receives fibers that is corticonuclear fibers from both the cortex. Part of nucleus which supplies the lower part of the face receives corticonuclear fibers only from the opposite side cortex. Let me explain. Talk about uh, human and element type of facial nerve paralysis. Suppose you have human type of lesion on the right side. The lower half of the opposite side of the face is affected. Your upper part of the face is spared because your frontal belly of occipital frontalis and orbicularis oculi muscle receives dual nerve supply. What do you mean by dual nerve supply? You get nerve supply from both the right and the left cerebral cortex. So, in human type of lesion, opposite lower half of the face is affected. Upper part is paid because of dual nerve supply. What happens in element type of lesion? This is what is called as Bell's palsy. When the nerve comes out of your stylomastoid foramen, there is a foramen between mastoid process and the styloid process. The nerve emerges out, passes through the parotid and divides into five branches to supply the ipsilateral side of the face. If you have lesion on the right side, you will have total half of the ipsilateral side of face getting paralyzed. So uh, what are the clinical features of Bell's palsy? You don't have wrinkles when you frown in the forehead. 
you cannot close your eyes properly with your upper eyelids tears rolls down over your cheek corneal reflex is disturbed so you may have corneal ulcer which may even lead to corneal blindness obliteration of nasolabial fold due to paralysis of buccinator food gets accumulated in the vestibule drooling of saliva deviation of angle of mouth towards the opposite side these are the clinical features of bell's palsy now what do you mean by bell's phenomena when you try to close your eyes with your upper eyelids your eyeball rolls above upwards and outwards and this is called bell's phenomena so this pattern of facial nerve is called pes anserinus you can see the clinical features of bell's palsy finally let's move on to crocodile tears syndrome what is crocodile tears so here let us consider the lacrimatory nucleus and superior salivary nucleus lacrimatory fibers i'm using black color and salivary fibers in red color okay from the geniculate ganglion you have greater petrosal nerve joins with the deep petrosal nerve to relay in the pterygopalatine ganglion and this supplies your lacrimal gland now the salivary fibers okay we have cauda tympani branch joins with the lingual nerve which relays in the submandibular ganglion to supply submandibular and sublingual salivary glands suppose if you have lesion proximal to the geniculate ganglion and later when the fibers regenerate the salivary fibers joins with your greater petrosal nerve and supplies the lacrimal glands so when we eat during salivation we also lacrimate and this is called crocodile tear syndrome lacrimation during salivation is called crocodile tear syndrome okay thank you so much